Dipsy is just uh, is one of the educational initiatives that the Berkman Center has. Um, we have a history of doing educational initiatives. Um, so here's a few of them. Uh, the H2O platform um, and Youth and Media, which uh, Sandra Cortezzi <laughs> is the director of. Um, Copyright X and Digital Problem Solving Initiative. Um, so the Digital Problem Solving Initiative is currently in its second year. Um, and it's an opportunity for students, staff, faculty, and other people affiliated with Harvard uh, to come together to work on some real-world problems. Um, you can find our website. Uh, uh, it'll be at the end of the presentation, but it's blogs.law.harvard.edu slash dipsy. Um, and every week, the various project teams um, write up a blog post about what they've been up to. Uh, Dipsy has three goals. Um, the first one is to promote multi-directional mentorship and learning. Uh, we believe that learners of all ages can learn from each other. Um, and we believe in promoting a community of practice to promote that. Uh, additionally, uh, we're pursuing institutional and issue diversity through interdisciplinary work, which is a lot of I words. Um, and we are also working to encourage fluency in digital literacies. Um, as we know, digital literacies are increasingly critical for today's students and young people joining the workforce. Um, how students actually have those opportunities to um, explore those digital literacies is still a problem we are working on, um, but we're hoping that Dipsy uh, is one of those offerings. Um, although it's, its second year, it's actually in its third iteration, so last year Dipsy ran for a full uh, academic year, and this year we've split it up into two semesters. Um, so these are some of the projects from last semester, and you can see that they pretty much range all over the university. Um, some students were working on sexual assault, some students were working on the uh, Harvard Food Project, um, other people were working with uh, um, on an open access project. Um, and some of those projects continued into the spring, and those projects are the ones that we'll be presenting today. Uh, but we also have a few new projects, such as um, a team that's working with Professor John Hansen at the Harvard Law School on their systemic justice project, uh, as well as a couple of women working with Kate Crontiris, who is a fellow at the Berkman Center on 21st century girlhood. Um, so Olivia's here to talk about the Big Data Group, which is uh, led by uh, Professor Jim Waldo. Um, in addition to talking about the content of her project, uh, she'll also be talking a little bit about some of the meta questions that are associated with Dipsy, such as the skills or the structure of the program. Um, and I thought that it might be easiest for each person to present and then offer a few minutes for questions after each presenter. Uh, so, yeah, Olivia, take it away. Thank you. Hi, my name is Olivia. Um, I'm a senior at the college studying statistics and computer science. Um, so today I'm going to be talking on behalf of the Big Data Group. Um, it's led by Jim Waldo, who's the CTO of Harvard, but also does a lot of work with edX and HarvardX, um, which is the data we've been working with. And um, one of my teammates, Hillary, is here right now. So um, the, as, th as the amount of big data has been increasing, there's this inherent conflict in big data between the utility of a data set and the privacy of the subjects who are included in this data set. So you can think about um, whenever there's a data set that contains sensitive information, so this can be educational data sets, this can be medical data sets, um, and a lot of other fields as well. Um, researchers would like access to the raw data, right? They, they don't want anything to be censored. They would love to know the gender, the birthday, um, as much information as they can about these people so they can make the most accurate uh, conclusions, right? But then when you think about um, the data in terms of the people whose um, information is in the data set, they would like very much the opposite, right? They would like as little data um, given released about them as possible. They would like their birthday to not be the exact day. They'd like the year or even not even that, right? So there's this inherent conflict between the utility of data sets and the privacy of data sets. So this is kind of what our group has been looking at. Um, so the first useful thing to define in this context is what our notion of privacy has been. 
So we've been using this notion of privacy called k-anonymization. And this means that each record in the data set must be indistinguishable from at least k minus one other rows in its identifying features. So let's look at an example and what this means in terms of the example. So if this um, data set uh, containing nine people's records and their grades on a certain test, if, if this is the data set we're looking at, right now this is considered to be k anonymous with k equal to three. And the reason for this is that if the state of residence is seen as the identifying characteristic, um, then if I know that a certain person, Bob, is in this data set and he lives in Massachusetts, I can only narrow him down to at most th one of three people um, because there's three people from Massachusetts. So the minimum um, number of times that someone occurs with a certain quasi-identifying field is three in this data set. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so let's say now that I have an educational law that requires this data set to be five anonymous instead of three anonymous. So now this data set is not able to be released to the public yet because I can narrow someone down to less than five people, which is um, bad for their privacy, right? So there's two things I can do. The first thing I can do is I can generalize the, um, the values of the state in order to uh, kind of combine the New York and Massachusetts value into one. And if I do this, now there are nine people with like a New England or Eastern US value. So this data set is more than five anonymous, so that's good. I can't narrow anyone down to less than five people. The second thing I can do is I can suppress the values that are troublesome. So I can take the three Massachusetts values and say that um, since they're too identifying, I just throw them away. So that's the second um, that's the second method that can be done, and that's called suppression or deletion. Okay, so um, now we want to look at this k anonymization um, uh, in terms of an actual data set in order to see the effect that k anonymization has on um, biasing a data set. So we've been looking at the edX data. This is a massive online open course platform. Um, there are a lot of courses from Harvard and MIT, but other institutions has, have also joined. So we've been looking at the data from fall 2012 and spring 2013 for five different Harvard X courses. So the educational law, as, um, as dictated by FERPA, requires that this data be anonymized with k equal to five before being released to the public. So um, this means that in terms of the quasi-identifying fields, which in this case there are six, so the six quasi-identifying fields are course ID, year of birth, gender, country, level of education, and the number of forum posts. So no combination of these six traits can occur less than five times. So each, each person in this data set must have a combination of these traits that occurs at least five times. Um, so interestingly, um, when we looked at the anonymized edX data versus the true edX data, we saw a lot of skew in the um, in certain characteristics, such as grade. So we saw that um, certain summary statistics, like the mean, were significantly different in the true data set than the data set that was being released to the public because the, the latter data set had been anonymized. So the big question that we're looking at is why this shift occurred. So in order to understand why this shift occurred, it's, it, um, it's important to think about why a row would be deleted in the first place, right? So um, going back to our definition of k-anonymity, a row is deleted if it's too unique in terms of its quasi-identifying fields. So a row is more likely to be deleted if it has a rare quasi-identifying value or a rare combination of these quasi-identifying values. So this is the first thing that we wanted to look at. Is there a relationship between um, variables of interest, such as grade, and how often certain quasi-identifying fields that are associated with it occur. Um, and we saw, um, from, as shown in these graphs, that um, more rare values of quasi-identifying characteristics are, tend to be associated with higher grades. So um, the x-axis here is the number of times a certain quasi-identifying value occurs, and the y-axis is the grade, and we see that um, rare values tend to be associated with high grades. So this means that rows that are deleted tend to be rows with higher grades, which means that the anonymized data set tends to be skewed downwards in terms of grades. 
So is there a way that we can, um, we can kind of quantify whether this relationship between the rarity of a quasi-identifying field is actually what causes um, a data set to be uh, more skewed? So there are three different things that we can do to kind of explore this. So the first is increasing K. So in K anonymity, the higher K is, the greater of a privacy standard there is. So if we only require there to be three people with a certain set of quasi-identifiers, that's, um, that's kind of, uh, that requires less anonymity than if we require 10 people to have that, right? Because that'll cause more people to have to be deleted. So if we increase K, we can see whether the skew of the grade increases. Another thing we can do is if there's one or two quasi-identifying columns that are highly correlated with grade, but other ones are not, then maybe if we just completely eliminate those quasi-identifying columns and don't report them at all, we would expect the skew to also decrease. And then finally, if we just manually change the correlation of these data set, of the correlations uh, between these, the rarity of these um, values with the grade, then we would also expect to see a difference in the amount of skew in the data set. So we look at these three different things. So first we look at increasing K. So as we increase K, the anonymity standard gets more strict. And we saw that as, um, as K became higher, um, the mean grade became lower and the mean performance also became lower. And this is exactly because of the observation we had before where rare values are associated with high grades and high performers. So as we became more strict with the anonymization, we saw in fact that our expectations that the performance of the data set would decrease did in fact decrease. So this is, um, this is in line with our expectations. We also saw that as we increased K, the activity level of the people in the data set also decreased. The second thing we did was eliminate quasi-identifier columns. So one of the six quasi-identifiers in particular was very highly negatively correlated with grade. So the number of forum posts, it tended that the more people posted, the higher a grade they would have. and. Um, and so when we completely eliminated this column from the analysis and therefore didn't anonymize on it anymore, we saw that the grade of the resulting data set was much higher than, um, than previously before. And this is because we weren't deleting all of those people who were uh, posting a lot of times and also performing very well. So this was also in line with our expectations. And then finally, um, we manually changed the correlation between different quasi-identifiers rarity with the grade. Um, and we, uh, we plotted the entropy for these data sets. And entropy is a measure of uh, kind of how much data is missing from a data set. So we see that as we made the correlation less and less negative, we saw that the entropy decreased, which is a, um, which is a desirable quality. Um, and we also saw that as we made the correlation less negative, the mean grade approached the true grade. Uh, and the true grade here is, um, is represented by the horizontal black line at the top. Um, so overall, we found three different confirmations that um, the rarity of a quasi-identifying field with a certain numeric quality, in this case grade, um, did cause more bias in the anonymized data set. So this means um, this kind of identified something specific we can look at when we anonymize data sets in the future. We can um, kind of do some analysis beforehand and say, is including this quasi-identifier even worth it? Or is it going to cause too much skew in the data set? Um, so definitely more, more analysis can be done into how to solve this problem, but it's valuable to have um, identified it as a uh, problem overall. Um, and then I'd just like to talk for a minute or two about our experience with Dipsy. So it's been great um, to have this as like an overall structure that has allowed us to, first of all, meet each other and have a mentor. Jim Waldo has been a great mentor. We meet every week. Um, he, he works on the code as well alongside us, just like another another peer, so it's been great to work with him and also to find other people who are interested in the same questions.
Yeah. Um, yeah, my question would be, how do you identify a quasi-identifier? I mean, is quasi -ident uh, is the elimination of, of, of those quasi-identifiers really a way to safely de-anonymize the data? Or um, if I combine the, the data that is published in the end with other data sets that are available somewhere, can I still, um, through correlations, identify the people who were participating there? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. So um, to answer your first question, the definition of a quasi-identifier is a column that can be joined with another data set, plausibly, in order to um, re-identify the data set. So that's, that's why we anonymize on these quasi-identifiers. So by, um, by requiring that there be at least K people with a certain um, combination, we require that even if I have this outside data set that I can join, um, I will have at least K people. I will only have a 1 over K chance of being able to guess that person. So that's kind of the whole notion of why K anonymity is useful, because even when you join it, you only have 1 over K chance. Yeah. 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 How many students were <clears throat> in the data set? Does more students make it a lot easier to do this? or? Mm -hmm. Or do you still have the same problems? Um, sorry, easier to do? Easier to do anonymization. Okay. Um, so there were 440,000 rows in the original data set. That doesn't necessarily mean 440,000 uh, students because um, some students take multiple courses. Um, but the, so I'm not sure if this exactly answers your question, but um, so the more students there are, the less of a percentage will be um, will be eliminated due to anonymization just because there's more people. So it's more likely that there will be at least five people with a certain combination. <laughs> so definitely, um, we tried doing some analysis on smaller data sets because this anonymization process takes a while. It takes about an hour to anonymize a data set. So we tried doing it on some small data sets, but these small data sets, like the number of the amount of representation of these quasi-identifiers is so much smaller that you end up um, like chopping about like 60 or 80 percent of your data. So actually more data is better in this case um, because we're looking at like K as a count. Um, uh, but you do have the trade-off of more rows taking a longer time to analyze. Yeah. Yeah. Examples of quasi identifiers, and in particular, uh, ones which have high uh, relationship to grade. Yeah, um, so the five other quasi-identifiers in this case were all kind of demographic, so um, their education level, their age, um, their country, uh, gender. Um, and the number of forum posts was an interesting choice of quasi-identifier. So the only reason that that was a quasi-identifier in the first place was because these, forum po these forums were online and publicly accessible to anyone. So anyone could easily write a scraper and then um, just count how many times each person asked a question. And then they could plausibly join that with their identity. So that's the only reason it was a quasi-identifier. If, if this forum was not publicly accessible, then it wouldn't have been. But um, it makes a lot of sense that this, um, this quasi-identifier was kind of unfortunate because the more times someone posts, the more engaged they are, right? And the better they're likely to do. So I think this was actually like an odd situation that there was such a correlation, because you would expect there to be a correlation between such a quasi-identifier. But I think that in most, in most cases, like, um, like medical data sets, I think there's not such a strong correlation. The only other like kind of plausible thing that I could think would happen kind of often is for, in medical data sets, for certain conditions mm -hmm. to be correlated with age, um, such as heart disease. Um, so, but I think in general, this was kind of an odd case for education data. Yeah, thanks so much.
Hi everyone, my name is Jen Krava. I am in the Master of Design Studies program at the Graduate School of Design and my focus is art design in the public domain. And I am on the Safe Campus Dipsy group. Our mentor is Professor Diane Rosenfeld who is at the law school. Over the past year, 64 U.S. universities, including Harvard, have come under scrutiny by the Department of Education for the mishandling of sexual violence and harassment complaints. While policy reform, as required by the DOE, and judicial procedures related to dealing with sexual harassment cases are important, societal views and individual behaviors must change as well in order to prevent these incidents from occurring. This can begin with bystanders an often overlooked resource and essential element of safe public spaces, who can serve as public intervention mechanisms in the prevention of sexual violence and assault, a role supported by multiple studies, which I can provide for you if you'd like. We're creating a mobile application that builds a digital coalition of bystanders to empower students to seek help in uncomfortable situations. The app's working title is Bonobo App and takes cues from the unique social structure of bonobo monkeys. Bonobos successfully create a community network of defense in which victims of aggression are defended by his or her, her group until the situation dissipates. The Bonobo app allows students to take control of their college campuses by taking a pledge to aid classmates in times of need. The Bonobo app would have dual functioning modes, one for if the user is moving locations like walking home and one for stationary locations like being at a party. For example, if the user is walking somewhere and would like to have virtual company, the walking route can be shared by activating the walking option, making the user's location visible to selected contacts. Or if the user is at a party and would like selected contacts to know where she is in the event assistance may be needed, the location can be shared by activating the destination option and can also be entered in the chat function on the app. In both modes, the Bonobo app produces a network in the virtual public that will be called upon to act within the physical public should the user need assistance. This social network is based either on the user's personal contacts or his or her geographical location, thus creating a coalition of contacts both known and unknown to the user. Although there are a number of personal security apps already on the market, none are compatible with the unique social and spatial dynamics of Harvard's campus or of college campuses in general. Circle of Six, Panic Button, and Be Safe all create digital networks of support, but they are based solely on a user's personal contacts. Kite String restricts the number of emergency contacts and the number of times you can utilize it each month without paying for it. Guardly does not create a network of support, rather it connects you to the police by pushing one button instead of dialing 911. While it is important to call upon those you know and trust to come to your aid in times of stress, the bystander network has even greater potential when broadened to include those within a localized vicinity of the user. Harvard students are independent, self-sufficient, and involved in various activities and organizations across campus. <coughs> Most of the time, they're not in the same geographical proximity as their best friends and emergency contacts. The Bonobo app will expand the bystander network to include both trusted contacts as well as others who are also signed into the app and are within a specific vicinity that is determined by the user. It will provide incentives to increase bystander intervention and will also create a private support network for survivors and app users who have been in uncomfortable situations and are unsure of what action to take. We envision the app to contain the following key features. Setting and tracking location using GPS, <coughs> excuse me, allowing to set a walking route or produce specific information regarding location, for example, what floor or room of a specific building the user is in, adding friends to the app, making it a social network but not social media, and creating different levels of friends such as closest friends or initial contacts or people within a certain proximal location, <clears throat> allowing the user to set check-in properties and alerting the user's contacts in an em emergency. It would also have the potential to add specific information like what you're wearing or the specific room you're in, sort of like a Facebook status, but again, this would not be a social media app, and allow the user to message their top contacts and you would also be able to create personal privacy settings and determine who the alert is sent to, whether it's friends, proximal people, or a mix of both. We plan to conduct focus groups with various stakeholders on campus and foresee having multiple rounds of these focus and testing groups throughout the development of the app. These groups will consist of several different samples of Harvard community members so as to cover many angles of the app as possible. Currently, some of the specific demographics we would like to target are male final clubs and fraternities, female final clubs and sororities, 
graduate student men and women, freshmen, and people involved in sexual assault prevention advocacy like Our Harvard Can Do Better and Harvard Students Demand Respect. These groups all constitute different parts of the larger Harvard community, and therefore we expect to get different constructive responses from all of them. We've already been in contact with several representatives of these associations and plan to conduct our first round of focus group sessions soon. As we glean information and feedback from the fo focus groups, we will continue to refine the app's functionality and aesthetic. The Bonobo app would only be available to Harvard students upon its release, and users would be required to sign in with their Harvard University ID number, thus allowing for the pull of data <clears throat> that would show how many people did not check in, how many bystanders dissolved uncomfortable situations, how many times campus police were called, et cetera. By working through this project as part of Dipsy, we have been provided with a platform on which we can make connections and build relationships with groups and individuals across campus who could be important stakeholders in the project. We have also had multiple opportunities to get feedback during different stages of the project and in varying capacities from one-on-one -on -one meetings to large group presentations like this. Because of that feedback, we have learned how to mediate multitudes of suggestions in order to maintain the original goal of the Bonobo app. We have also been able to think critically about the larger issue of sexual harassment and its causes and have made connections between this issue and products that are currently available as solutions. The Dipsy community has provided us with a virtual testing ground to flesh out our proposal. The flexibility we have been afforded in combination with the support from the Dipsy staff have been key factors in working through our Bonobo app project. Thank you. Any questions? University? As far as like the Title IX coordinator in my office is, you know, we just added the link to the Harvard mobile app, the share website, and there's a bunch of stuff already in the works. So, yeah, we've been working through a lot of those contacts um, through our mentor, Dr. or Professor Rosenfeld, um, and we're in the very initial stages of making those contacts and doing the focus groups. But we'd Don't be worry, happy I be to. Up, we'll be the whole team of people worried about this. That'd be fantastic. Great. Yeah. I just want to ask what the status of this was, and is it for uh, multiple platforms or just uh, Apple platforms? Uh, we're trying to figure out what the best platform would be. We'd probably start with Apple yeah. initially, uh, and then figure out how we can transfer it to Android. Um, and the status of it is the very beginning it's of, like of development. Figuring it. Is not really started yet. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, we applied to both the Dean's Challenge and the President's Challenges, um, and so we'll hear in a couple of weeks to find out if it's something that we have won, and they would be able to help help us actually build the app. Do you see what would be the motivation of people to join? Uh, I mean, not potential people who are in a vulnerable situation that might want to join, but those who might be defenders, so how you motivate them to join the network? We're trying to come up with an incentive system so that if you do help someone who hasn't checked in or has found themselves in an uncomfortable situation, you receive some sort of incentive, whether it's points that could be turned into a gift card or some sort of Harvard merchandise, something like that, but we would incentivize it to get people to sign up. Yeah. I'm curious how, obviously, it's tied to Harvard ID, so that's a kind of barrier to preventing bad actors from, from bystanders turning into bad actors, and I wonder right. what other mechanisms you have to ensure that. Yeah, that's a really good question, and something that we've talked about a lot but don't have an exact solution for yet. Um, we, we started with the Harvard ID to, to to hope that that could be maybe the biggest thing that would help. But yeah, I, I don't even, we don't really know. That's, that's all I can tell you. If you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to ask along the lines of actually signing up with an ID. And a lot of people in these situations prefer to be anonymous and remain anonymous. Yeah. So how do you deal with that with, in relation to data privacy? Yeah, uh, maybe that's something we need to discuss with the big data group. But um, the Harvard ID would not be visible to anyone who is on the app. It would only be used to pull information. Um, 
So we could anonymize it somehow. It possibly could be where you create your own username, but you have to sign in with that ID so that there's a way to at least track what's happening. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Sure. I assume that you've already dealt with the making sure that when somebody is no longer registered at Harvard, that they unregister that they're, they remove from your system. Because for instance, you know, there's a lot of summer students, extended students who come and go who have IDs for you know a summer or a semester or two and then aren't part of Harvard anymore. Right. That's, you, want, you want them no longer to be part of your system if you're restricting it to Harvard. Yep, that's a great point. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, um, you said you were going to have focus groups, so I don't know if you've actually had any yet, but I was wondering what student response would has been so far on just the fact that you're kind of tracking their data and they're not going to class, they're going to parties where there might be tense social situations and things that you might, they might not necessarily want people to track where they're going at specific times. Right. What their concerns have been and what their thoughts have been. Um, we've reached out to people and different associations to find out if they would be interested in being part of the focus groups. So we haven't gotten into that level of detail yet, but it's a really great point and it's something that we've had a lot of talks about, but I think a lot of the capability would be up to the user. So you could enter as much information as you want to, but then it could have, it could have effect on how quickly help could get to you. So there's a there's a trade off, but it could totally be up to the user. I'm a lecturer, and it happened once to me that one of my students during her study abroad period was assaulted, mm -hmm. and the first thing they took from her was her cell phone. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in emergency cases, it's what happens. Then? So the the idea behind it is that you would set, as the user, you would set how often you would like it to remind you to check in. And so if you don't check in with it after a certain amount of time, it will yes. notify your contacts. Mm -hmm. So if your phone is taken, it can still work. Okay, it, a, a little bit. We're trying to figure out what the, the optimum time is between when you don't check in and when help is notified. Yeah. Um, uh, this is, to a certain extent, responding to other questions as well, but um, mm -hmm. uh, further questions along the line of incentivization. Um, it seems like, I mean, you know, as you say, part of the design space that you're working within is the university campus and the unique kind of social norms that obtain here. Um, uh, what's your thinking about how to you know, integrate the app into social life? Um, you know, not only to incentivize people once they've joined up, but to notify people that this thing is possible and, you know, to maybe to a certain extent um, explore uh, the shift in perception that would seem to come along with, you know, before an event takes place, being prepared to act in this way it seems like, um, you know, it's one thing to be presented with the issue, but it's another to say, yeah, I'll, I'll step in um, and, and I raise my hand to them. So, you know, what's your thinking about the kind of, um, how, how you get uptake? That is something that is being dealt with in these cases all over the place, and I don't think anyone really has an answer. Um, something that probably doesn't specifically get to what you're asking that we've been thinking about is hopefully pairing with um, orientation during freshman week at campus and letting them know that this could possibly be the the official Harvard app that you could join. Um, that doesn't shift the perception, but there's a group on campus called the Harvard Students Demand Respect, and they're working with training coordinators at the graduate schools, I know, um, and working on doing new training situations and bystander intervention could be a big part of those and that could help shift the perception as well. I know that doesn't really... No, but it's part of the broader social space and the, the, even the pedagogical um, mission of the institution is in, are entailed in, in this kind of project. So yeah. it's good to hear how, how you put it on the map as well. Good, thanks. Thank you. Sure. Is there a way of going yeah. the web here or no? Okay. Okay, cool. So hello, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Joe Steele. I'm one of the kind of founding instigators of uh, DocShop, which is an interactive documentary workshop. It was 
kind of a, a two-part uh, provocation that came to us from Dipsy uh, and also from MetaLab uh, in terms of like troubling this idea of interactivity and documentary. Oops, I suppose I ought to go to my slides. Is this a full screen? Yeah, so this is uh, for lack of um, preparing a slideshow. This is just kind of what we had submitted as a, uh, uh, a proposal for the uh, Harvard Innovation Lab design, uh, Dean's Design, I mean, sorry, Dean's Cultural Entrepreneurship Challenge. Um, so we thought this was kind of like an interesting way of framing the question of interactive documentary. And, and um, our initial conversations were, uh, came out of, this idea of like workshopping work by artists and, and documentary filmmakers and makers and uh, various people that would come to us, um, but also wanting to get our hands dirty and really uh, work with media and stage encounters with media, um, perhaps in convivial environments where you get to talk to people and have conversations. Um, so um, we worked with this. Uh, here, I'll, I'll go to the artist. So we made a prototype um, with uh, the Egyptian Lebanese artist Lada Baladi, who's currently a Open Doc Lab fellow at MIT. And um, we, we built this room, which was a sort of a, like, uh, it's, it was meant to mirror uh, Tahrir Square because she has this incredible archive of images and um, videos and you know some things from public, the public domain and some things that were from her own archive, and we we staged this encounter um, in a, in as kind of like a theater in the round where there's no seats and then the kind of traditional stage and kind of broke outside of that um, Plato's cave uh, you know conception of the theater is sitting down it's not participatory the information goes one way the narrative goes in one direction and just made it so that there was a, a conversation and then um, conversations among the media happening uh, at the same time. Um, so it was really useful to prototype this, both in Laura's own work with her archive and then in our work as Doc Shop and kind of defining our problem moving forward. Um, and then at an outcome of this is there, there's going to be a curated uh, kind of conversation uh, this semester. Uh, which we're working with MetaLab and, and with Lada uh, to stage. And uh, it involves some federated research and combining uh, several different archives about Tahrir and about you know the 25th of January in Egypt generally, and uh, bringing together these archives so that it could be searched from a single point. And that was that kind of like went well with um, some work that MetaLab had done with uh, archives. Uh, you know, federating archive, which had to do with the tsunami, I think, in, yeah, in Japan. Yeah, the Japan disaster archive. Yeah. Let's get to it. Yeah, and, and this this connection and, and some of these, uh, you know, other things that Lara will be participating in, including in, in D.C., kind of came out of this and her work with this archive. And um, there were some articles written about this piece. And, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, that we were able to do it in the semester and, and kind of make some waves and uh, start start working with the media. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll have to kind of refine this, oops, to a pitch, but the, the sort of, pro we, we sort of framed it as problem solution and then our formula. Uh, so like the problem is that university life is siloed and all these really interesting people come here and they may not produce work. I mean, they may conduct research and then go on back to their homes and you know make make stuff once they get there uh, but we kind of thought a way of uh, solving this problem and kind of moving the paradigm from competition to collaboration would be to uh, create a space where like a physical space but also a space where people could meet and talk about interactive documentary talk about archive talk about memory more broadly and, and producing narratives and have those kind of organic partnerships that would happen amongst graduate students, undergraduate, uh, faculty, fellows, and a, and a broader public. And our kind of like formula is that our, our team is very skilled with translational um, strategies and, you know, kind of br you know, bringing something from the idea ideation phase to, 
you know, a prototype. You know, this this room that we created was a prototype. It's essentially a paper prototype or a model, um, and we were able to get feedback from real audiences uh, based on that. Um, so we have a kind of a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team of artists, technologists, archivists, journalists, and uh, humanists and historians, and you know, we're adding to that. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll see. I have, we have to refine this to like one elevator pitch, and so the uh, the committee looking at the iLab applications won't. They'll only look at the pitch. So it'll be. I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on you know, uh, what do you think about the the way that we're framing this problem, and then, um, yeah, di I guess to answer your question, how did Dipsy? Uh, help us uh, realize this, and it it brought us together. Even though the question was incredibly open-ended, um, and it uh, allowed us to support Lada in realizing th this kind of pr prototype with the archive, and then it's allowed her to reach out to like institutions and and to kind of start talking with curators and other practitioners and um, other folks who have been working with archives across uh, a number of different disciplines. And then also, uh, there's one other point I was going to make. Yeah, so we'll, we'll continue our collaboration with her at least till this semester. In addition, oh, the challenge, that's it. So what's the challenge? Uh, so how do we maintain the identity of DocShop while supporting one artist in a really engaged way? Um, so that's something that we're negotiating is like how do our how do we keep our identity sort of from getting too entwined with the work of this one artist? Um, and so we're, we're trying to carve out time to do the workshopping and to do the, the network building and the collaborations with other uh, institutions while at the same time fulfilling our promise uh, to incubating her project. Is, is part of your concept of creation of a library that you would maintain as well of the work that you produce? Uh, so it's a it's a kind of two part. Uh, I think the arch the the archive and the library will exist, but it's not a physical library. But 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 yeah. Searchable data. Uh, yeah, that's 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 something that make an effort to maintain everything in catalog. Yeah, that's something that Lada is working with. Um, I guess we were kind of interested initially in how do you take archive and then make narr like dense, complex narratives out of that, or to to kind of how to bring together narratives. But doc the mission of DocShop itself is to be the this two part thing of uh, like a, a table like this where we sit around and workshop uh, interactive documentaries. But then also incubating one artist project in a really in-depth way, um, and the the purpose of the workshop is to kind of build our vocabulary and add to the body of knowledge of interactive documentary, but also um, just to kind of create those connections and and um, it it also enriches the experience of the artist that's in residence at the time because they might meet people or or frame their thinking about archive or about documentary in a way that they hadn't thought about before. So I don't know. Does that kind kind of answer your question? <laughs> well, it tells me I'm still confused. What? I, it, it tells me I'm still a little confused. You, you said you were going to work on your elevator pitch, and I'm still. Oh, that yeah, that. that's that's so, a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah. So could you provide any practical example of how this works or any story behind it? Just a picture of, I don't mm. know, just a case study or something <coughs> just, just, mm, to, to illustrate mm -hmm. this. So. To, il to illustrate yeah. uh, the kind of like a, a stem to stem. We could do like a step. So um, one person who's creating a, a portal uh, to, I don't know, to Baghdad, for instance, like they want to create a portal to the American University there, 
And so they might come in and say, oh, here, here are the tools that I've been using, and then here are the problems that I ran into. And then between the knowledge that we have uh, between MetaLab and um, DocShop, we could provide some directions and some resources that they might go to. And so that's one part of it. And then the other anecdotal part is that we, you know, there's the artist residency program. And so that's kind of separate. So the, so Lotto's project, like she came to us and uh, we built, we helped her to build this prototype. And then as a result of this, she's talking with curators. And so that's the anecdotal part that goes with the artist incubator. And then the, the other part is essentially like a, a small think tank, like, a room like this. I don't know, Matthew, can you? I, yeah, sure. I mean, just to maybe flesh out a little bit more um, kind of expository um, sense of, of, of what DocShop has been about and sort of the narrative. It emerged um, out of an interest uh, that, that we have at MetaLab um, to ask questions about the use of interactive documentary in a variety of situations, journalistic situations, um, scholarly situations, and um, in, in the arts as well. Uh, there's a sense that uh, this is a kind of burgeoning, um, you know, field of, of practice. Um, and while there's been a lot of thought given to sort of tools for making interactive media, platforms, um, you know, programmatic tools, technologies, um, uh, there's, there's not been a lot of attention, not as much attention has been paid either to sort of the critical evaluation of these kinds of projects, how they how they land in journalistic circles and scholarly circles um, in the art world, um, and the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of aesthetic dimensions, what makes them good, what makes them, um, what, what attracts us to them. Um, it's a space that documentary filmmakers in particular um, <clears throat> are feeling both attracted to but also nervous about because they feel a kind of radio, you know, video kill the radio star kind of, um, uh, concerned that as interactive media come along, will the documentary cinema experience be um, be curtailed? So we began with these kinds of questions in mind, um, attracted a group of students who are interested in making interactive media, um, and began to workshop their projects. Into that mix, uh, Lara Baladi came along as an artist who's a resident actually in the Open Docs Lab at MIT <coughs> right now. Um, her project really is focused on this. She's, a, she's an artist. Um, uh, with, with, you know, who's shown work in galleries um, around the world. She was also deeply involved with the Tahrir Square uprising, in the midst of which she created this archive. So the question of the archive came into the doc mm -hmm. shop. Um, it, you know, we encountered it kind of emergently. It wasn't initially part of, it wasn't in the crosshairs. We were interested in interactive media. Um, but of course, interactive media um, often crucially depend on collections of media. Um, the Japan Disaster Archive that, that Joe mentioned is one example of a project that we worked on with the Reich Howard uh, Center for Japan Studies here at Harvard um, to create this, this kind of federated media archive of the 2011 disasters, the Fukushima um, Daiichi plant disaster and the tsunami that caused it. Those were um, archives that had been created by journalists and media organizations, um, as well as by scholars and individuals, um, mm -hmm. by social media platforms. And finding ways to preserve those kinds of um, media objects are very challenging. So with respect to DocShop, we've kind of carved that, that dialogue off. That's a separate conversation to this prior conversation about why we want to do interactive media in the first place. To, to try and answer that question, the group um, devised this notion of a prototype with Lara. Um, you know, we initially wanted, we were, were thinking in terms of uh, interactive documentary projects that are typically, as they often are, browser-based. Um, some precedents include projects like Welcome to Pine Point, Bear 71. A lot of projects have come out of the, um, um, the interactive documentary lab um, of the, um, uh, uh, in Canada. Uh, but also Snowfall and a whole host of projects that the New York Times has pursued, as well as scholarly projects. Yep. So these are often browser-based, and we began to wonder what it would be like to animate interactive media in physical space, it's something that happens in the art world quite commonly. Um, so to bring a lot of, um, in terms of the translational thinking that Joe mentioned, to bring a lot of the energy of the art world, um, of performance, um, of sort of convivial encounter in space, um, to the question of interactive media became the kind of 
experiment that Lara Baladi's project with Dockshop was about. So the idea being, can an artist come work with this group of students who are also designers and technologists um, to realize a project? Um, does that provide us with a prototype for a kind of iterative model for um, for cultivating and incubating such projects in the future? And, and that's what the, mm -hmm. the um, the ask to the cultural entrepreneurship challenge is targeted at, is that question. Is there a utility in a space where artists, media makers, filmmakers could come um, and meet others with, um, you know, interdependent skills and sensibilities and devise, um, uh, you know, workable, um, uh, uh, impactful interactive media projects in a context that also attends to their kind of aesthetic qualities. Mm -hmm. So, That's I'll, a really interesting I probably never heard about. I don't think we have similar projects in Russia. So, do do, do you have any other examples? Of well, it's a big, no. it's a, it's a growing, it's an emerging <laughs> discourse, and it's probably worth a lunch talk on its, it's own. A, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a really interesting topic. Yeah, it is to be sure. To be so sure. We're going to need to close up soon. But does anyone have any last questions or questions for me about Dipsy in general? Well, thank I asked you. about the last one. How would I find out about more events like the one that happened uh, last month mm -hmm. in December? Oh, this uh, you can you can email uh, you can email me. Um, hold on, I'm going to try to pull up. Is there a web page that we have a splash page? Um, how do I uh, go to it? Splash. Yeah, it's a, it's just a web page, a very basic web page. And all of the projects um, also talk about their various events and things on the website. Space. Um, space dot what? Just dot space. It's dot space. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like. Uh, I didn't know there was a space domain. Okay. We, yeah, okay. we thought that was a fun one. Right. Uh, so th yeah, then uh, you can just contact me. Let's see. I'm trying to think of. Yeah, my email is on the slide. It's, uh, yeah, you can just. Is that? Hmm? I'll give you my card. <laughs> How's that sound? Right. It's cool. Definitely, you can check the docshop.space <laughs> website yep. for more. metalab.harvard.edu and the Dipsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. We'll make ourselves know. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.